the United States' leading figure of adoption in the early and mid-1900s was wearing a veil of a caring, committed philanthropist who seemingly devoted her life to rescuing children in need of a home. Georgia Tan was recognized nationwide for removing the stigma on orphan children and adoption, but as she walked through life, she was secretly paving the road of her dark legacy as a child abductor, an abuser, and a murderer. Georgia Tan was born in 1891 in Mississippi. Her father, a very powerful and strict judge, did not permit his daughter to follow her passion to become a lawyer, as he held the belief that this was not a job for a woman. He instead forced her to complete a music degree and only allowed her to take the bar exams, where she successfully passed them. He then got her a job as a social worker at the Mississippi Children's Home Society. By 1924, she was fired from the home after they discovered that she was removing children from their underprivileged homes without any cause. Using his political connections, her father managed to secure her a job as an executive secretary in the Memphis branch of the Children's Home Society within the same year. By 1929, Using her tactics, Georgia managed to stage a takeover and named herself executive director, where she remained as such for over 20 years. The children's home was thought to be the leading orphanage agency in the United States, with Georgia being praised by the whole country for shifting the adoption procedure and managing to place over 5,000 children in loving homes. But all happened under her devious, evil practices. Georgia took advantage of the lack of regulations surrounding adoptions, a fact that allowed her to establish herself as the leading adoption agency in the whole country. Prior to the 1900s, adoptions were very uncommon due to the stigma that was attached to unmarried mothers and their children, and the families who were adopting back then were only using the children for farm labor or send them to factories so they can earn a wage to give to their adoptive parents. With the rise of industrial revolution and subsequent new laws preventing child labor, the adoption for manual labor started to decline. At the same time, the eugenics movement had the nation perceiving these children as genetically flawed with the eugenics notion supporting that poverty, criminality and more were in fact hereditary. This resulted in over 60,000 imposed sterilizations to take place in America. But armed with her own narrative on eugenics-driven beliefs, Georgia was on a mission to shift this perspective of forced sterilization and poverty by arguing that although low-income and single parents were incapable of properly raising their children, the poor and homeless children themselves were not flawed or sinners and she was presenting them as acceptable or even irresistible to childless but rich families. Her narrative went on to insist that the children themselves were not imperfect or damaged and that all they needed was a wealthy adoptive family to shape them into better people. This in time helped to transform adoption into a highly regarded cause and even elegant within affluent circles and by setting the stage for increased demand for child adoption, along with the decline of birth rate, Georgia began stealing and trafficking children from as early as 1924. According to the law within the state of Tennessee, adopting a child back then was at a cost of $7, which only concerned the services of the agency and nothing more in an effort to prevent immoral tactics such as the selling of children. But with her deep knowledge of the law and the lack of forceful adoption regulations, Georgia crafted a business model that entailed targeting famous and affluent families who were residing in all corners of the United States and who were willing to pay her at a premium fee of over $1,000 to $5,000 for each private adoption. These adoptions were taking place in states including New York, California, Mississippi, Arkansas, and Missouri, and her targeted clientele consisted among others politicians, millionaires, and celebrities. 
but all were happening in the wild when no one was recognizing that they were participating in an illegal enterprise. Georgia's child trafficking involved a number of paid social workers who would make the necessary trips all over the country with as many as six babies at a time and in the middle of the night to avoid any suspicions or too many questions. They would meet the adoptive parents at a hotel lobby with a baby in their arms. Once they made the exchange, the social workers would veer off, call the next family, and then come back to meet a new set of parents whilst holding another baby. For all of this to be accomplished, the prospective parents were overcharged for the agency's travel costs and supposed background checks that were in fact never ensued, as well as adoption administrative fees of up to five times the actual cost. The profits were kept in a secret bank account, where it was estimated that Georgia kept 90% of it, with the remaining earnings directed to her co-conspirators involved. But the worst of it all was how she was acquiring the babies to meet the demand. Unbeknownst to her clients, the majority of the babies adopted were in fact stolen from their families. Georgia Tan developed close ties with Edward Boss Cramp, the corrupted and feared Memphis mayor, who allegedly facilitated the success of her black market adoption scheme. With his paid help, she expanded her network of corrupted officials, where she was bribing them to assist her with her monstrous deeds. Police officers, doctors and lawyers were all involved in spotting or kidnapping children themselves from hospitals, mental wards, playgrounds, churches, preschools, prisons, and even their own home yards when the spotters would detect children playing home alone. Once she was tipped off, Georgia would drive there and would pick the most appealing ones with higher preference to blonde blue-eyed kids. Her non-threatening appearance allowed her to approach the children with her shiny black car asking them in a caring, sweet voice if they wanted to take a ride with her car. Some of the children had never even set eyes to cars before, so when a seemingly gentle lady was offering them a ride, they couldn't deny. She would then pick them up, place them in her car, and leave. In some cases, single parents would drop their children off at nursery schools, only to be told that welfare agents had taken the children. In other instances, children would be temporarily placed in an orphanage because a family was experiencing illness or unemployment, only to find out later that the orphanage had adopted them out, or the record of the children being placed there in the first place magically disappeared. All authority figures who were in cahoots with her would supposedly also notify her of poor families or single parents who could not afford medical or other care for their children. It was stated that Georgia would visit their homes under the pretense of offering them for free the necessary medical care or temporary home for their children to get better, under the condition that their parents would not accompany her, otherwise they would be charged a hefty fee. Desperate parents who wanted what was best for their children would agree, but sadly never saw their children again, and they did not have the means or the power to fight back or find them. Many times they were told that their child had died and was already buried. Georgia would then bribe judges to allow her to falsify the children's records, such as their names, their birth dates, and even their real parents' backgrounds, in her efforts to increase their appeal and price to potential adoptive parents, and at the same time preventing their biological parents from ever tracking them down. She would also add on the records that the parents had signed off their children voluntarily, diminishing any possible suspicion that could arise. One such judge was Camille Kelly, a longtime judge of the Shelby County Juvenile Court in Tennessee. Judge Kelly, in fact, allegedly played a very important role in Georgia's black market adoption. Not only she expedited transfers of custody to Georgia, but she also threatened mothers and fathers who were divorced, widowed, unemployed, or even seriously ill forcing them to sign off their parental rights to Georgia on grounds of neglect. 
any complaints or lawsuits against Georgia from desperate parents who wanted their children back would magically disappear again in the hands of Judge Kelly. The judge's actions were later reported to account for 20% of the total of Georgia's stolen children. The decline of birth rate coupled with the increase of baby formula use posed a higher demand for infants by childless mothers. Georgia would pay nurses and doctors at maternity wards to assist with her actions. Some birth mothers were told that their newborn had died soon after birth or were stillborn, and in their grief the hospital staff would have them sign the supposed death certificate when they were in fact signing off their parental rights. Others that were under the influence of sedation were forced to sign routine paperwork, which in reality were legal documents to place their newborns up for adoption. Some were also told that turning over temporary custody was necessary to secure medical treatment for their children, but would never see their infants again. Georgia would also exploit the shame single mothers felt for giving birth out of wedlock and then forcing them to give their baby up with her threats. In her efforts to boost the adoption outlook even more, Georgia was giving speeches all over the country and was also advocating how these strategies were benefiting the taxpayers by reducing the support needed for single mothers and orphanages with the rise of adoption. She was also working hard to collect donations. And from 1928 onwards, she was running advertisements that targeted wealthy families with photos of children and captions like Yours for the asking or They'd like to be your Christmas gift. Later on, she also crafted a raffle draw scheme where she sold thousands of raffle tickets in her Christmas special baby giveaway. From that, it was claimed that she got thousands of dollars that people thought were giving to the Home Society. She also had a so-called baby catalogue, where clients could flip through and choose a baby from there. Clearly, Georgia feared no one, and that made her to be publicly audacious with her disgusting deeds. The mother of modern adoption, as she was often referred to, had a list of a very high-profile clientele that included U.S. congressmen, state representatives, state senators, as well as famous figures such as the actors Lana Turner, Mary Pickford, John Crawford, and June Allison with her husband Dick Powell. The assistance she received with having high-profile clients not only supported her to further popularize the idea of adoption, but legislators were more inclined to strengthen laws that were favorable to her operation, particularly out-of-state adoptions. Georgia's monetary success was further attributed to her willingness to give the children to everybody who was willing to pay. Her clients could be anyone or everyone as long as they paid the demanded fee, but this included those who were previously rejected by normal adoption channels based on their background. Older children were sold into slavery or to shady single men who only demanded young girls or boys, and she never even blinked an eye when she handed the children to them. On some occasions, Georgia would place two or three children in a home as a trial, and those who did not fit into the families would be returned back to her, sometimes even after a whole year had passed. When an adoptive parent would ask too many questions, or even went as far as discovering that the information on the child were not correct, such as in cases of falsified medical histories, Georgia would supposedly threaten them with possible legal actions that would force them to surrender the child. All again in the alleged help of Judge Kelly. She was also known to take children back from adoptive parents when they couldn't pay the full amount up front, and many of her clients were reported to have received blackmailing from her just so she could increase her profits. For a number of times, she would go back to the adoptive family under the pretense that the biological parents were asking for their child back, but with a substantial amount of money, she could have her lawyers to make the situation completely disappear. 
Georgia's evil tactics did not cease there. She expanded her networks to other countries, such as Great Britain, which allowed her to sell the stolen children there as well to childless families who wished to adopt. The children who were not promptly adopted were left at the orphanage for some time and had to endure their living conditions within the house until they were sold, or until they died. Georgia Tan's brutality extended within the house, with the children being exposed to very cruel and sweltering conditions. Neglect, physical, emotional and sexual abuse were a common occurrence. Children were dragged to keep quiet until they were sold, but if they still cried, they were beaten or hung in dark closets as a punishment or even starved for weeks with just bread and water offered to them. The filthy environment they were subjected to meant that children were more often than not afflicted with various diseases that many did not survive. If Georgia determined that an infant had a disability or in her twisted mind she viewed them as ugly or too weak for adoption, she would either leave them out in the sun to die or, if they were too old, she would have her people murder them or starve them to death. Stolen infants, who were just few hours old, were taken to the house despite them requiring medical care, and as a result many unfortunately did not survive. Georgia hired drug addicts as well as child offenders to watch their children within the house, but these people were just as awful and twisted as she was. They did not hesitate to subject the children to any form of abuse or exploitation. In fact, even Georgia was allegedly known to physically take advantage of the children in any shape or form. It just seems that the word evil should be synonymous to Georgia Town. Some of her victims were buried in a cemetery in Memphis, Tennessee, and some within the home society's property. The exact number of the children who suffered and died in her hands is not exactly known, but was estimated to be as high as 500. All the deaths and suffering never put a stop on Georgia's manipulative plans. She was not afraid of anything or anyone, and with Mayor Cramp's alleged corrupted help, she was protected from any investigation. In 1941, the Child Welfare League dropped the membership of the Children's Home Society on the grounds of deficiencies such as the advertisements that were running on newspapers, the inadequate background checks on foster or adoptive families, and the lack of education and professional training of the Home Society's employees. That didn't place a stop on Georgia from continuing her misdeeds for another few years. It wasn't until the newly elected governor of Tennessee, Gordon Browning, ordered an investigation to take place, and in September of 1950, he held a press conference exposing Georgia's financial offenses. Georgia died three days after the press conference from uterine cancer. Judge Kelly resigned two months later, and sometime after that, the Children's Home Society closed its doors. Georgia's inner circle, however, was working hard to abolish any records or traces, even after she died. As reports state, only two children who were at the home when it shut down were reunited with their families, even though many birth parents were desperately looking for their children and even hired private investigators to assist them. Despite the pleas, the adoption records were only open to the public in 1995. For some families, an overdue reunion took place, but for so many others, that sadly never happened, or it was too late. The trauma that stolen children and their families must have endured is only inconceivable. So many lives have been affected and forever overshadowed. The mothers who thought that their child had died, parents who knew that their children were out there but couldn't find them, and most of all the children themselves who suffered at the hands of the monstrous woman. It is estimated that over 5,000 children were stolen and over 500 died in the hands of Georgia, but no one was ever prosecuted. <laughs>